Hello and welcome to your CMIF1 Financial Operations, Chapter 1, The Conceptual Framework. Now, many of you may have seen the IFRS book, which is full of the IFRS and IS, International Accounting Standards. And at the start of this book, you have, almost as a uh, first chapter, the framework document. It is not a standard in itself like all the other standards that follow IS2 for inventory, IS16 for fixed assets, non-current assets and so on. It's basically a document that provides guidance and the common denominator for the creation of IFRSs. So in the conceptual framework you will find things like the quality uh, qualities of the information um, not just in a numerical form, but in qualitative sense. You will find definitions of the elements of the financial statements. You will find criteria of recognition that are very, very important. And as you progress into various standards, you will have to come back to these definitions and recognition criteria to probe and to challenge them and see if we, if we meet the definition and the recognition criteria to place the relevant elements um, in the respective financial statements. And of course, it illustrates a bit the true and fair concept, which I would like to maybe bring it a bit a bit to life and ultimately capital maintenance concepts. So all these things may sound to you at this very stage a little bit academic, but they are not. In fact, as I said earlier, they do give a basis for the IFRS creation and there can be situations where certain IFRSs or ISs as they have been created can conflict with the framework document. And in that specific case, you will have to know that the IFRS or IS overrides over the framework. Otherwise, when you do not have sufficient information in a standard, you will have to revert back to the framework document, to the definitions, to the recognition criteria, and so on. So this being said, hopefully um, we've made clear the relationship between the conceptual framework and the remaining uh, all the other standards in effect in, um, in the IFRS book. Now, the first part I would like to spend a few minutes on is the qualitative characteristics of financial information. When we prepare a set of financial statements, it is not just about the numbers in the financial statements, but it's about the quality of these numbers. And sometimes it's not just the quality of the numbers, we have to prepare, as you may be aware, disclosures and description of these numbers that have also to have a qualitative form. So it's not just the quantity of disclosure, but the quality of disclosure of the explanation provided to numbers. So what a financial accountant, a person who prepares financial statements, has to have in the back of their mind and always think when they put the transactions together in a set of financial statements, about the following qualities. So let's have a look at the first one, which is called understandability. The financial information we, we submit uh, to the stakeholders has to be understandable. All this quality um, of information means is that no matter how complex the information we record is, I give you an example, financial instruments, we want to make sure it is understood by any stakeholder even if such stakeholders do not have a financial background. So even if you are recommended to do minimal disclosure by the standard, feel free to add more explanation to provide most clarity to the information you prepare and you include in the financial statements. So make sure information is understandable. Another quality of information is relevance. And in fact, if I may just briefly mention relevance in connection with the other quality, reliability. Now what we are saying is that information that we submit um, for the attention of various stakeholders has to be relevant for the decision making, for the needs of, of them as stakeholders, different angles altogether sometimes. So what is relevant? If you think 
what the stakeholder generally wants to know is how the company is doing right now and how the company is going to do in the future. If you are an investor, you want to make sure your return on investment is acceptable to you and obviously it's acceptable as time goes by. So what is relevant to you as a stakeholder in general? And the same with the supplier, um, the same with clients. What is relevant to them? So any information about the present and future is relevant to them. So maybe forecasted financial data is relevant to them, isn't it? But how reliable is that? Well, talking about future is right, like reading in a crystal ball. So arguably, the more relevance you provide, the less reliable that information can be. Because particularly when it refers to present and future, it's much harder to make it reliable. You deal with risks, uncertainties brought by the future. But it's very, very important to strike a good balance between relevance and reliability. And that takes me to reliability. What does it mean, information being reliable? So if you think of financial statements as such, they basically reflect information as at the point in time or for a period that in fact happened. So is that information reliable to a very high extent should be reliable because it happened. And as long as it's free of material error and bias and reflects a true and fair view, it is reliable because there are transactions behind that can be validated because they happened. But the more reliable they are, could we get maybe less of a relevance? Because while you know things happen, particularly in today's world, how much past can still be a basis for the future uh, information or how much past can be a basis even to give you a good indication of where are going from here into the future. So what we say with this relevance and reliability is a fine line that we have to keep in order to maintain uh, in the right balance, relevance and reliability. So every time we prepare financial statements, we have to think, do we prepare it and it's enough understandable? Is it relevant to the stakeholders? Can they make decisions based on that information? And their decisions look from present to future more than the past. And how reliable is it? Is it, is it free of bias, free of error? Um, is it true and fair? And finally, you have to think when you prepare financial statements, you have to provide information that allows comparability from an accounting period to previous accounting periods. And how can we ensure that? We can do that by ensuring consistency through the accounting policy we are using. For instance, in depreciation method we are using from a period to another. In order to allow comparability, you would have to use the same method. If you had to change the method for a good reason during an accounting period, you may have to recalculate information so that you still allow comparison from current period to previous period. So this quality of information, of financial information, is of high relevance. And maybe as we go through the standards, I'll make sure I'll, I'll sort of link it back to the framework as much as possible to see that the framework document is equally important next to the standards, particularly when you don't have enough guidance in the standards, you'd have to come back to the framework document. And now let's move in the next part of your chapter one from your express notes of the same conceptual framework. So once we, you know about your qualitative characteristics of financial information, please do make sure for exam, but for your real life as a management accountant, you have a good understanding of what the elements of financial statements are in order to be able to interpret data accordingly. So, you all may be aware that you have the statement of financial positions that have assets, liabilities and equity. And then you have the statement of comprehensive income that has income and expenses. What the conceptual framework provides, it's a definition. And here comes some set of definitions that I strongly recommend you to understand them, learn them, and pretty much in terms of terminology used, use terminology as close as possible to these particular definitions. So what is an asset? 
And here are some buzzwords I would like you to remember and I'll emphasize why with an example. It's so important. An asset is a resource that is controlled by the entity and is expected to produce future economic benefits that will flow to the entity and implied, as we'll talk for liabilities in a minute or so, it's a result of a past event. And let's have a quick look. Let's take an example. I do like to think about the service industries. So much in our era, we have moved from a manufacturing, um, well, com uh, well, manufacturing type of company to a service company in many cases. We still have manufacturing, but the level of service industry has in increased tremendously. So take a service industry, and if I ask you what is the crucial fundamental asset, and not necessarily in a purely accounting sense, of, a, of such a business, of a service company, what would you say? I assume we all believe it's people. Okay, so if it's people, if we rely so much on people, let's see if we, if this definition meets the, the well, the recognition criteria in effect that we'll talk a bit later to include people into the statement of financial position. Why don't we include them? Because in effect, we do expect them to produce future economic benefits, don't we? And in fact, they generally are employed or have a form of agreement with the company which represent that they are the result of a past event. So how comes people are not assets? Well, can we control people? And while we can have a little debate here, I think that's one buzzword or element that we cannot prove in case of people. And while we believe they are the fundamental um, or most important inverted comma asset of an organization, because without those people, that organization does not exist, we still do not recognize people, and the argument is we cannot control them. Now, let's have a quick look at liability. What is a liability? As we said for the asset, it's a mirror effect, the opposite almost. It's a present obligation of the entity arising from past events, the settlement of which is expected to result in an outflow from the entity of resources embodying economic benefits. Now, this is a very straightforward definition, we hope. If you think of an agreement you may have with a supplier to purchase raw materials, is it a present obligation you have from of the entity? Yes, we have a present obligation to pay the raw materials we acquired. Is it a result of a past event? Yes, we have an agreement with the supplier. And is it expected to result in an outflow of resources? Absolutely, even if we bought on credit at some point, we'll see that outflow from the company leaving towards the third party. So most times you can go through the definition and say yes, this particular element is a liability. And we'll combine this discussion we have on definitions in a few minutes with the recognition criteria to make sure we can take those elements, whether it's an asset liability to the relevant financial statement, statement of financial position. And finally, you have equity, which is defined by the framework as the residual interest in the assets. It's very interesting, this word residual of the entity after deducting all its liabilities. So equity is pretty much a balancing figure and it shows that the standards do not focus so much on the equity and is very much driven by defining and recognizing assets liabilities and whatever balancing figure you have from the two assets liabilities that will represent your equity. So if you want the formula, assets less liabilities equal equity, and equity can be split in terms to capital plus reserves. All right, now the final two elements we want to put a definition upon, and they belong this time to statement of comprehensive income, is income itself and expenses. Now, when you look at income, again, if we highlight the elements of the definition we want to pause and think upon, uh, income is increases in economic benefits during the accounting period in the form of inflows or enhancement of assets or decreases of the liabilities that result in increases in equity other than those relating to contributions from equity participants. 
So in other words, if you have equity participants that contribute to the business, that of course will be dealt via the equity component. Any such increase would not represent income. Income though should come from any other stakeholders, any other parties, and it should be proven that increases economic benefits or enhances assets and so on. Now, when it comes to expenses, it's a mirror effect of the income. Again, you have to see the decrease in economic benefits during that particular accounting pre period based on the accrual matching concept in the form of outflow, outflows or depletions of assets. But you have to make sure these are other than those relating to distribution to equity participants because such distribution to equity participants would in effect mean dividends payable or appropriation of profits. Okay, so I think the definitions being said, we can move into the recognition criteria. So ultimately we look at definitions to know when it's appropriate to recognize an asset liability, equity, income or expense respectively in the financial statements. So for any of these items to be recognized in the financial statements, it must must pass the recognition criteria and these recognition criteria, please do remember them. I'll highlight the buzzwords or elements of this recognition criteria. First, it has to meet the definition of one of the five elements. So if you know your definitions, that's already one of the criteria, but that's not all. If an asset, you have to think if it's probable that an economic benefit will generate or will generate a flow to the entity. So what does it mean probable that economic benefit we referred earlier? Well, from best practice, probable means more than 50% chance to happen. Sometimes across standards, particularly IS 37, for instance, when you talk about provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets, you will see there the words probable often and possible. Possible is less likely to happen, is less than 50% to occur, but here to talk about recognition criteria, you meet the definition and also check out if these economic benefits are highly likely to happen with a chance of more than 50%. Again, this percentage is not given, it's more a best practice. Now you have besides definition and the probability of the outflow that you have to ensure it's highly likely, you have to say that it can be given a monetary value with reasonable reliability. So in other words, if you think, okay, I want to recognize this particular asset or this liability, if it's just an estimation or sometimes you cannot put a monetary value on it, as it is the case of provisions, for those of you who reviewed uh, the chapter on provisions, the standard IS-37, you know there will be situations where you can't put a monetary value and that's enough to say you're not meeting the criteria of recognition, therefore you're not going to include that element as a liability, for instance, in the financial statements. So these three criteria have to be met at the same time. And maybe just a little bit I would mention on the framework about the true and fair view. Now it's very, very important to know that this particular phrase is not, not defined as such by ISAB itself or in any of IFRS or the framework document. However, it's so important for us to know what means true and fair view. And in simple terms, true view means that you include all transactions that happen and you're not biased and you're making sure if they happen you are finding a way to record them, to reflect them in the financial statements or at least to disclose them and inform stakeholders about such information, such transactions. And FAIR means that when you're making, for instance, an estimation, that could be the case for accruals or provisions, because they are estimations, you're, they're not accurate, you would not, ref as such, 100% accurate, you would not say necessarily they're true, but you could say we are seeking to have a fair view of such estimations. So as long as that provision you create provides a fair view of the underlying element you want to provide for and the risk attached to that, then um, 
we are seeking a completeness of true and fair view of our transactions. This being said, I strongly recommend you to recap in full and have a good understanding of the framework so that when we meet for the next chapters and then we enter to cover standard by standard, you will be very, very strong into almost exercise what we call professional judgment in situations where maybe the standard doesn't give you a clear guidance and you have to revert back to your knowledge of the framework document. Thank you so much for listening. Best of luck with your preparation and see you to the next chapters up in your SEMA F1. All the best.